Good morning and thank you for this amazing opportunity. I appreciate the time limit, which would have come in handy during my last wedding speech. <laughs> my sister-in-law would agree. These past few months have been among the most energizing of my entire career in life. I've talked to so many brilliant people, and when I reflect on those conversations, I keep coming back to the part of teaching that has always been most meaningful to me, the relationships. Now, I'd never call myself a relationship expert, and neither would my ex-girlfriends for that matter, <laughs> but I cherish the bonds that I make with my students. Their stories inspire me, and when they get to know me, I can inspire them to work toward their own passions. The power of relationships is what made me want to be a teacher. I originally taught English as a second language in Madrid, as a means to travel, but I quickly realized that it was what I was meant to do with my life. I learned so much more from that first group of students than they did from me, especially a shy five-year-old girl named Violetta. After several weeks of trying and failing to teach Violetta with flashcards and picture books, she still curled up in a ball in fear every time she saw me. That was when I got desperate. Desperate enough to dance. <laughs> Violetta's mom told me that her daughter loved singing and dancing, so I came to our next lesson with an iPod full of kids' songs and my most embarrassing dance moves. Unfortunately, my sister-in-law has seen those too. <laughs> After a couple of songs, Violetta was laughing, and by the end of the lesson, she was singing along with the English words for head and shoulders, knees and toes. The situation empowered me to return home and become a teacher. I teach high schoolers now, but the lessons that I learned from Violetta still resonate with me today. Since then, the educational landscape has grown more complicated, from pandemic disrupted learning, to homelessness, to AI, and more. Our world is changing, and we need to be willing to change with it. For me, that means changing the way that I discipline students, and doing so by focusing on making meaningful connections like I did with Violetta. The punitive approach to discipline is outdated and no longer serves the need of our students. We can't wait flat-footed for our students to misbehave. Instead, we need to build a strong community foundation that's both preventative and anticipatory. Multi-tier restorative practices provide a framework for that foundation. There are a lot of misconceptions about restorative practices, like that they're just for discipline. But by definition, their main purpose is to strengthen social connections within communities. This begins with Tier 1 culture building and can evolve into Tier 2 restorative discussions with a trusted facilitator mediating between two or more parties. In the most severe cases, schools, parents, and students work together to create three, uh, Tier 3 school reentry plans. This isn't a new idea, but it also hasn't received the universal buy-in that it deserves. I first began piloting restorative practices five years ago, but after two kids, two job changes, a move, and a nationwide lockdown, I haven't exactly taken over the world with it like I'd hoped to. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, I'm still piloting today. I love my school, but it has a traditional approach to discipline. I see the same infractions from the same students to the detriment of the same victims time after time after time. We're so busy putting out fires that many hesitate to reinvent their school's culture. We already have enough on our plates, they say. To them, I would respond the same way that I do to my students when they groan that they have to use every part of the writing process, from brainstorming to drafting to revising. It will be worth it. Yes, it will always be more work to switch from something existing to something new. But the work up front will create a culture that will pay dividends in morale, achievement, safety, and inclusion. And once that system is in place, our jobs will be easier. Studies have shown the correlation between restorative practices and a decrease in repeat offenses, suspensions, and violent actions. They have also seen improvement in school climate, student achievement, and disciplinary equity. I used Tier 2 restorative practices this fall after breaking up a fight that occurred when a black student in our mostly white school lunged at a white student who had used a racial slur. Under the letter of the law of our punitive system, each student would receive an equal three-day out-of-school suspension. Equal, but not equitable. This didn't sit well with me, and I expressed as much in conversations with my students, their parents, my administrators, and my peers. He's done that before, people said to me, after I mentioned that this student had used a racial slur. But as a firm believer in the growth mindset and restorative practices, I set out to break that cycle of prejudice. I wasn't able to completely override my school's punishments, but through restorative dialogue with two students and their classmates, 
we rebuilt a supportive learning environment where everyone's voices were respected and heard, which we maintained for the rest of the school year. I followed up with my student who had been called a slur to make sure he felt supported and welcomed in his learning environment and that he hadn't been targeted again. Additionally, the white student delivered a sincere apology after learning more about the harm of hate speech from one-on-one -on -one conversations with an expert colleague. Finally, my white student joined me in the Friends of Rachel's Club, whose goal is to spread a chain reaction of kindness in our community. When the student returned to our class, he had respect for me and his classmates. My hope is that through restorative practices, we can turn the conversation from, he's done that before, to him saying, I won't do that again. I'm grateful that restorative practices have improved my teaching, but I'm only one person, and there's a limit to what I can do, even with a 64-ounce coffee tumbler at my disposal. <laughs> Together, we can do so much more. Restorative practices have improved culture in social work, offices, and prisons, and it's easy to see how their conflict resolution and community building strategies could be effective in other interactive work environments. But educators need to lead the way. It'll take hard work, professional development, and patience but it will be worth it. And when it's done, we can stop focusing on putting out fires and start focusing on what really matters, the relationships. Thank you.